Lawrence of Arabia. Lawrence of Arabia is a 1962 epic historical drama film based on the life of T.E. Lawrence. It was directed by David Lean and produced by Sam Spiegel through his British company Horizon Pictures, with a screenplay by Robert Bolt and Michael Wilson. Starring Peter O'Toole in the title role, the film depicts Lawrence's experiences in the Arabian Peninsula during World War I, in particular his attacks on Aqaba and Damascus and his involvement in the Arab National Council. Its themes include Lawrence's emotional struggles with the personal violence inherent in war, his own identity, and his divided allegiance between his native Britain and its army, and his newfound comrades within the Arabian Desert tribes. As well as O'Toole, the film stars Alec Guinness, Jack Hawkins, Anthony Quinn, Omar Sharif, Anthony Quayle, Claude Rains, and Arthur Kennedy. Lawrence of Arabia was nominated for 10 Oscars at the 35th Academy Awards in 1963, it won seven in total, including Best Picture and Best Director. It also won the Golden Globe Award for Best Motion Picture, Drama and the BAFTA Awards for Best Film and Outstanding British Film. In the years since, it has been recognized one of the greatest and most influential films in the history of cinema. The dramatic score by Maurice Jarre and the Super Panavision 70 cinematography by Freddie Young are also highly acclaimed. In 1991, Lawrence of Arabia was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant and selected for preservation in the U.S. Library of Congress National Film Registry. In 1998, the American Film Institute placed it fifth on their 100 Years, 100 Movies list, and seventh on their 2007 updated list. In 1999, the British Film Institute named the film the third greatest British film of all time. The film is presented in two parts. Divided by an intermission. The film opens in 1935 when Lawrence is killed in a motorcycle accident. At his memorial service at St. Paul's Cathedral, a reporter tries to gain insights into this remarkable, enigmatic man from those who knew him. The story then moves backward to the First World War, where Lawrence is a misfit British Army lieutenant, notable for his insolence in education. Over the objections of General Murray, Mr. Dryden of the Arab Bureau sends him to assess the prospects of Prince Faisal in his revolt against the Turks. On the journey, his Bedouin guide, Tafis, is killed by Sharif Ali for drinking from his well without permission. Lawrence later meets Colonel Brighton, who orders him to keep quiet, make his assessment, and leave. Lawrence ignores Brighton's orders when he meets Faisal. His outspokenness piques the prince's interest. Brighton advises Faisal to retreat after a major defeat. But Lawrence proposes a daring surprise attack on Aqaba, its capture would provide a port from which the British could offload much needed supplies. The town is strongly fortified against a naval assault but only lightly defended on the landward side. He convinces Faisal to provide 50 men, led by a skeptical Sharif Ali. Teenage orphans Daoud and Faraj attach themselves to Lawrence's servants. They cross the Nafud Desert, considered impassable even by the Bedouins traveling day and night on the last stage to reach water. One of Ali's men, Kasim, succumbs to fatigue and falls off his camel unnoticed during the night. When Lawrence discovers him missing, he turns back and rescues Kasim, and Sharif Ali is won over. He gives Lawrence Arab robes to wear. Lawrence persuades out Abu Tayy, the leader of the powerful local Hawitat tribe, to turn against the Turks. Lawrence's scheme is almost derailed when one of Ali's men kills one of Ali's because of a blood feud. How Etat retaliation would shatter the fragile alliance, so Lawrence declares that he will execute the murderer himself. He is then stunned to discover that the culprit is Ghassim, the very man whom he risked his own life to save in the desert, but he shoots him anyway. The next morning, the Arabs overrun the Turkish garrison. Lawrence heads to Cairo to inform Dryden and the new commander, General Allenby, of his victory. While crossing the Sinai Desert, Daoud dies when he stumbles into quicksand. Lawrence is promoted to major and given arms and money for the Arabs. He is deeply disturbed, however, confessing that he enjoyed executing Ghassim, but Allenby brushes aside his qualms. He asks Allenby whether there is any basis for the Arabs' suspicions that the British have designs on Arabia. When pressed, the general states that they do not. Lawrence launches a guerrilla war, blowing up trains and harassing the Turks at every turn. American war correspondent Jackson Bentley publicizes Lawrence's exploits making him famous. On one raid, Faraj is badly injured. Unwilling to leave him to be tortured by the enemy, Lawrence shoots him dead before fleeing. When Lawrence scouts the enemy-held city of Diru with Ali, he is taken, along with several Arab residents, to the Turkish Bay. Lawrence is stripped, ogled, and prodded. Then, 
for striking out at the bay, he is severely flogged before being thrown into the street. The experience leaves Lauren shaken. He returns to British headquarters in Cairo but does not fit in. A short time later in Jerusalem, General Allenby urges him to support the big push on Damascus. Lawrence hesitates to return but finally relents. Lawrence recruits an army that is motivated more by money than by the Arab cause. They cite a column of retreating Turkish soldiers who have just massacred residents of Tafis. One of Lawrence's men is from Tafis, he demands, no prisoners. When Lawrence hesitates, the man charges the Turks alone and is killed. Lawrence takes up the dead man's battle cry, the result is a slaughter in which Lawrence himself participates. Afterwards, he regrets his actions. Lawrence's men take Damascus ahead of Allenby's forces. The Arabs set up a council to administer the city, but the desert tribesmen prove ill suited for such a task. Despite Lawrence's efforts, they bicker constantly. Unable to maintain the public utilities, the Arabs soon abandon most of the city to the British. Lawrence is promoted to colonel and immediately ordered back to Britain, as his usefulness to both Faisal and the British is at an end. As he leaves the city, his automobile is passed by a motorcyclist who leaves a trail of dust in his way. The crew consisted of over 200 people, with the cast and extras included this number would increase to over 1,000 people working to make the film. Various members of the film's crew portrayed minor characters. First assistant director Roy Stevens played the truck driver who transports Lawrence and Farage to the Cairo HQ at the end of Act 1, the sergeant who stops Lawrence and Farage is construction assistant Fred Bennett, and screenwriter Robert Bolt has a wordless cameo as one of the officers watching Allenby and Lawrence confer in the courtyard. Steve Bertils, the film's gaffer, plays the motorcyclist at the Suez Canal, Lean himself is rumored to be the voice shouting Who are you? Continuity supervisor Barbara Cole appears as one of the nurses in the Damascus hospital scene. Most of the film's characters are based on real characters to varying degrees. Some scenes were heavily fictionalized, such as the attack on Aqaba, while those dealing with the Arab Council were inaccurate, inasmuch as the Council remained more or less in power in Syria until France deposed Faisal in 1920. Little background is provided on the history of the region, the First World War, and the Arab Revolt probably because of Bolt's increased focus on Lawrence. The second half of the film portrayed a completely fictional depiction of Lawrence's Arab army deserting almost to a man as he moved further north. The film's timeline is frequently questionable on the Arab revolt in World War I, as well as the geography of the Hejaz region. For instance, Bentley interviews Faisal in late 1917, after the fall of Aqaba, saying that the United States has not yet entered the war, yet the U.S. had been in war for several months by that time. Further, Lawrence's involvement in the Arab revolt prior to the attack on Aqaba is completely excised, such as his involvement in the seizures of Yenbo and Wedge. The rescue and execution of Qasim is based on two separate incidents, which were conflated for dramatic reasons. The film shows Lawrence representing the Allied cause in the Hejaz almost alone with only one British officer, Colonel Brighton there to assist him. In fact, there were numerous British officers such as Colonel Cyril Wilson. Stuart Francis Newcomb, and Pierce C. Joyce, all of whom arrived before Lawrence began serving in Arabia. In addition, there was a French military mission led by Colonel Edward Bremont serving in the Hejaz, of which no mention is made in the film. The film shows Lawrence as the sole originator of the attacks on the Hejaz Railroad. The first attacks on this began in early January 1917 led by officers such as Newcomb. The first successful attack on the Hejaz Railroad with a locomotive destroying Garland Mine was led by Major Herbert Garland in February 1917, a month before Lawrence's first attack. The film shows the Hashemite forces as consisting of Bedouin guerrillas, whereas in fact the core of the Hashemite forces was the regular Arab army recruited from Ottoman Arab cows, who wore British-style uniforms with kefiyas and fought in conventional battles. The film makes no mention of the Sharifian army and leaves the viewer with the impression that the Hashemite forces were composed exclusively of Bedouin irregulars. Many complaints about the film's accuracy concern the characterization of Lawrence. The perceived problems with the portrayal begin with the differences in his physical appearance, the Peter O'Toole was almost taller than the man whom he played. His behavior, however, has caused much more debate. The screenwriters depict Lawrence as an egotist. The degree to which Lawrence sought or shunned attention is debatable, as evidenced by his use, after the war, of various assumed names. Even during the war, Lowell Thomas wrote in with Lawrence in Arabia that he could take pictures of him only by tricking him, 
although Lawrence did later agree to pose for several photos for Thomas's stage show. Thomas's famous comment that Lawrence had a genius for backing into the limelight referred to the fact that his extraordinary actions prevented him from being as private as he would have liked. Others disagree, pointing to Lawrence's own writings to support the argument that he was egotistical. Lawrence's sexual orientation remains a controversial topic among historians. Bolt's primary source was ostensibly Seven Pillars, but the film's portrayal seems informed by Richard Aldington's biographical inquiry which posited Lawrence as a pathological liar and exhibitionist, as well as homosexual. This is opposed to his portrayal in Ross as physically and spiritually recluse. The film's depiction of Lawrence as an active participant in the attack and slaughter of the retreating Turkish columns who had committed the toughest massacre was disputed at the time by historians, including biographer Basil Littlehart, but most current biographers accept the film's portrayal of the massacre as reasonably accurate. The film does show that Lawrence could speak and read Arabic, could quote the Quran, and was reasonably knowledgeable about the region. It barely mentions his archaeological travels from 1911 to 1914 in Syria and Arabia, however, and ignores his espionage work, including a pre war topographical survey of the Sinai Peninsula and his attempts to negotiate the release of British prisoners at Qut in Mesopotamia in 1916. Furthermore, in the film, Lawrence is only made aware of the Sykes-Picot agreement very late in the story and is shown to be appalled by it, whereas the real Lawrence knew about it much earlier, while fighting alongside the Arabs. Lawrence's biographers have had a mixed reaction towards the film. Authorized biographer Jeremy Wilson noted that the film has undoubtedly influenced the perceptions of some subsequent biographers, such as the depiction of the film's Ali as the real Sharif Ali rather than a composite character, and also the highlighting of the Dira incident and Anthony Nutting before the film's release. The film's historical inaccuracies are, in Wilson's view, more troublesome than what can be allowed under normal dramatic license. At the time, Little Hart publicly criticized the film, engaging Bolt in a lengthy correspondence over its portrayal of Lawrence. The film portrays General Allen B. as cynical and manipulative, with a superior attitude to Lawrence, but there is much evidence that Allen B. and Lawrence here respected and liked each other. Lawrence once said that Allenby was an admiration of mine and later that he was physically large and confident and morale so great that the comprehension of our littleness came slow to him. The fictional Allenby's words at Lawrence's funeral in the film stand in contrast to Theriel Allenby's remarks upon Lawrence's death, I have lost a good friend and a valued comrade. Lawrence was under my command, but, after acquainting him with my strategical plan, I gave him a free hand. His cooperation was marked by the utmost loyalty and I never had anything but praise for his work, which, indeed, was invaluable throughout the campaign. Allenby also spoke highly of him numerous times and, much to Lawrence's delight, publicly endorsed the accuracy of seven pillars of wisdom. Allenby did manipulate Lawrence during the war, but their relationship lasted for years after its end, indicating that in real life they were friendly, if not close. The Allenby family was particularly upset by the Damascus scenes, where Allenby coldly allows the town to fall into chaos as the Arab Council collapses. Similarly, General Murray was initially skeptical of the Arab revolt's potential, but he thought highly of Lawrence's abilities as an intelligence officer. Indeed, it was largely through Lawrence's persuasion that Murray came to support the revolt. The intense dislike shown toward Lawrence in the film is in fact the opposite of Murray's real feelings although for his part Lawrence seemed not to hold Murray in any high regard. The depiction of Aouda Abu Tayyi as a man interested only in loot and money is also at odds with the historical record. Aouda did at first join the revolt for monetary reasons, but he quickly became a steadfast supporter of Arab independence, notably after Aqaba's capture. He refused repeated bribery attempts by the Turks and remained loyal to the revolt, going so far as to knock out his false teeth which were Turkish made. He was present with Lawrence from the beginning of the Aqaba expedition and in fact helped plan it along with Lawrence and Prince Faisal. Faisal was far from being the middle-aged man depicted and was in his early thirties at the time of the revolt. Faisal and Lawrence respected each other's capabilities and intelligence. They worked well together. The reactions of those who knew Lawrence and the other characters say much about the film's veracity. The most vehement critic of its accuracy was Professora. W. Lawrence, the protagonist's younger brother and literary executor, who had sold the rights to Seven Pillars of Wisdom to Spiegel for £25,000. Arnold Lawrence went on a campaign in the United States and Britain denouncing the film, famously saying, I should not have recognized my own brother. 
In one pointed talk show appearance, he remarked that he had found the film pretentious and false. He went on to say that his brother was one of the nicest, kindest and most exhilarating people I've known. He often appeared cheerful when he was unhappy. Later, Arnold said to the New York Times, the film is, a psychological recipe. Take an ounce of narcissism, a pound of exhibitionism, a pint of sadism, a gallon of bloodlust and a sprinkle of other aberrations and stir well. Lowell Thomas was also critical of the portrayal of Lawrence and most of the film's characters, believing that the train attack scenes were the only reasonably accurate aspect of the film. The criticisms were not restricted to Lawrence. The Allenby family lodged a formal complaint against Columbia about the portrayal of him. Descendants of Aud Abu Tai and the real Sharif Ali went further, suing Columbia despite the fact that the film's Ali was fictional. The Aud case went on for almost 10 years before it was dropped. The film has its defenders. Biographer Michael Corda, author of Hero, The Life and Legend of Lawrence of Arabia, offers a different opinion. The film is neither the full story of Lawrence's life or a completely accurate account of the two years he spent fighting with the Arabs, yet Corda argues that criticizing its inaccuracy misses the point, the object was to produce, not a faithful docudrama that would educate the audience, but a hit picture. Stephen E. Tabachnik goes further than Corda arguing that the film's portrayal of Lawrence is appropriate and true to the text of Seven Pillars of Wisdom. British historian of the Arab Revolt David Murphy wrote that, though the film was flawed due to various inaccuracies and omissions, it was a truly epic movie and is rightly seen as a classic. Previous films about T.E. Lawrence had been planned but had not been made. In the 1940s, Alexander Corda was interested in filming the Seven Pillars of Wisdom with Lawrence Olivier, Leslie Howard, or Robert Dana as Lawrence but had to pull out owing to financial difficulties. David Lean had been approached to direct a 1952 version for the rank organization, but the project fell through. At the same time as pre-production of the film, Terence Radigan was developing his play Ross which centered primarily on Lawrence's alleged homosexuality. Ross had begun as a screenplay, but was rewritten for the stage when the film project fell through. Sam Spiegel grew furious and attempted to have plays suppressed, which helped to gain publicity for the film. Dirk Bogart had accepted the role in Ross, he described the cancellation of the project as my bitterest disappointment. Alec Guinness played the role on stage. Lean and Sam Spiegel had worked together on the bridge on the River Kwai and decided to collaborate again. For a time, Lean was interested in a biopic off Gandhi, with Alec Guinness to play the title role and Emmerich Pressburger writing the screenplay. He eventually lost interest in the project, however, despite extensive pre-production work, including location scouting in India and a meeting with Jawaharlal Nehru. Lean then returned his attention to T.E. Lawrence. Columbia Pictures had an interest in a Lawrence project dating back to the early 50s, and the project got underway when Spiegel convinced a reluctant A.W. Lawrence to sell the rights to the Seven Pillars of Wisdom for £22,500. Michael Wilson wrote the original draft of the screenplay. Lean was dissatisfied with Wilson's work primarily because his treatment focused on the historical and political aspects of the Arab Revolt. Lean hired Robert Bolt to rewrite the script to make it a character study of Lawrence. Many of the characters and scenes are Wilson's invention, but virtually all of the dialogue in the finished film was written by Bolt. Lean reportedly watched John Ford's film The Searchers to help him develop ideas as to how to shoot the film. Several scenes directly recall Ford's film most notably Ali's entrance at the well and the composition of many of the desert scenes and the dramatic exit from Wadi Rum. Lean biographer Kevin Brownlow notes a physical similarity between Wadi Rum and Ford's Monument Valley. The film was made by Horizon Pictures and Columbia Pictures. Principal photography began on May 15, 1961 and ended on September 21, 1962. The desert scenes were shot in Jordan and Morocco, as well as Al Maria and Danana in Spain. It was originally to be filmed entirely in Jordan, the government of King Hussein was extremely helpful in providing logistical assistance, location scouting, transportation, and extras. O'Toole did not share the love of the desert of the character he played, stating in an interview, I loathe it. Hussein himself visited the set several times during production and maintained cordial relationships with cast and crew. During the production of the film, Hussein met and married Tony Gardner who was working as a switchboard operator in Aqaba. The only tension occurred when Jordanian officials learned that English actor Henry Oscar did not speak Arabic but would be filmed reciting the Quran. Permission was granted only on condition that an imam be present to ensure that there were no misquotations. In Jordan, 
Lean planned to film in the real Aqaba and the archaeological site of Petra, which Lawrence had been fond of as a place of study. However, the production had to be moved to Spain, much to Lean's regret, due to cost and outbreaks of illness among the cast and crew before these scenes could be shot. The attack on Aqaba was reconstructed in a dried riverbed in southern Spain, it consisted of more than 300 buildings and was meticulously based on the town's appearance in 1917. The execution of Gassim, the train attacks, and Vera exteriors were filmed in the Almeria region, with some of the filming being delayed because of a flash flood. The Sierra Nevada mountains filled in for us rock, Lawrence's winter quarters. The city of Seville was used to represent Cairo, Jerusalem, and Damascus, with the appearance of Casa de Pilatos, the Alcazar of Seville, and the Plaza de España. All of the interiors were shot in Spain, including Lawrence's first meeting with Faisal and the scene in Aldis 10. The Taufus massacre was filmed in Warzazat, Morocco, with Moroccan army troops substituting for the Turkish army, however, Lean could not film as much as he wanted because the soldiers were uncooperative and impatient. One of the second unit directors for the Morocco scenes was André de Toth, who suggested a shot wherein bags of blood would be machine gunned, spraying the screen with blood. Second unit cinematographer Nicholas Rogue approached Lean with this idea, but Lean found it disgusting. De Toth subsequently left the project. The film's production was frequently delayed because shooting commenced without a finished script. After Wilson quit early in the production, playwright Beverly Cross worked on the script in the interim before Bolt took over, although none of Cross's material made it to the final film. A further mishap occurred when Bolt was arrested for taking part in an anti nuclear weapons demonstration, and Spiegel had to persuade him to sign a recognizance of good behavior for him to be released from jail and continue working on the script. Camels caused several problems on set. Otula was not used to riding camels and found the saddle to be uncomfortable. While in Amman during a break in filming, he bought a piece of foam rubber at a market and added it to his saddle. Many of the extras copied the idea and sheets off the foam can be seen on many of the horse and camel saddles. The Bedouin nicknamed Otula Balisvinja, meaning father of the sponge. The idea spread and, to this day, many Bedouins add foam rubber to their saddles. Later, during the filming of the Aqaba scene, O'Toole was nearly killed when he fell from his camel, but it fortunately stood over him, preventing the horse off the extras from trampling him. Coincidentally, a very similar mishap befell the real Lawrence at the Battle of Abu el lissal in 1917. In another mishap, O'Toole seriously injured his left hand during filming by punching through the window of a caravan while drunk. A brace or bandage can be seen on his left thumb during the first train attack scene, presumably due to this incident. Along with many other Arab countries, Jordan banned the film for what was felt to be a disrespectful portrayal of Arab culture. Egypt, Omar Sharif's home country, was the only Arab nation to give the film a wide release, where it became a success through the endorsement of President Gamal Abdel Nasser, who appreciated the film's depiction of Arab nationalism. To shoot Lawrence, Super Panavision technology was used meaning spherical lenses were used instead of anamorphic ones, and the image was exposed in a 65mm negative, then printed onto a 70mm positive to leave room for the soundtracks. As the montage-like rapid cutting was more disturbing on the widescreen, filmmakers had to apply longer and more fluid takes. Shooting such a wide ratio produced some unwanted effects during projection, such as a peculiar flutter effect, a blurring of certain parts of the image. To avoid the problem, the director often had to modify blocking, giving the actor a more diagonal movement, where the flutter was less likely to occur. When asked whether he could handle cinemascope, David Lean said, if one had a knife for composition, there would be no problem. The film score was composed by Maurice Shar, little known at the time and selected only after both William Walton and Malcolm Arnold had proved unavailable. Shar was given just six weeks to compose two hours of orchestral music for Lawrence. The score was performed by the London Philharmonic Orchestra. Sir Adrian Bolt is listed as the conductor of the score in the film's credits, but he could not conduct most of the score, due in part to his failure to adapt to the intricate timings of each cue, and Jarre replaced him as the conductor. The score went on to garner Jarre his first Academy Award for Music Score, substantially original and is now considered one of the greatest scores of all time, ranking number three on the American Film Institute's top 25 film scores. Producer Sam Spiegel wanted to create a score with two themes to show the Eastern and British side for the film. It was intended for Soviet composer Aram Khachaturian to create one half and British composer Benjamin Britten to write the other.
The original soundtrack recording was originally released on Call Pix Records, the records division of Columbia Pictures, in 1962. A remastered edition appeared on Castle Music, a division of the Sanctuary Records Group, on August 28, 2006. Kenneth Alford's March The Voice of the Guns is prominently featured on the soundtrack. One of Alford's other pieces, The Colonel Bogey March, was the musical theme for Lean's previous film The Bridge on the River Kwai. A complete recording of the score was not heard until 2010 when Tadlow Music produced a CD of the music, with Nick Rain conducting the City of Prague Philharmonic from scores reconstructed by Lee Phillips. The film premiered at the Odeon Leicester Square in London on December 10, 1962 and was released in the United States on December 16, 1962. The original release ran for about 222 minutes. A post-premiere memo noted that the film was 24,987.5 feet and 19,990 feet. With 90 feet of 35mm film projected every minute, this corresponds to exactly 222.11 minutes. Richard May, VP Film Preservation at Warner Brothers, sent an email to Robert Morris, co-author of a book on Lawrence of Arabia, in which he noted that Gone with the Wind was never edited after its premiere and his 19,884 feet of 35mm film, corresponding to 220.93 minutes thus. Lawrence of Arabia is slightly more than one minute longer than Gone with the Wind and is, therefore, the longest movie ever to win a Best Picture Oscar. In January 1963, Lawrence was released in a version edited by 20 minutes, when it was re-released in 1971, an even shorter cut of 187 minutes was presented. The first round of cuts was made at the direction and even insistence of David Lean, to assuage criticisms of the film's length and increase the number of showings per day, however, during the 1989 restoration, he passed blame for the cuts onto deceased producer Sam Spiegel. In addition, a 1966 print was used for initial television and video releases which accidentally altered a few scenes by reversing the image. The film was screened out of competition at the 1989 Cannes Film Festival and at the 2012 Carlo Viveri International Film Festival. A theatrical re-release in 2002 celebrated the film's 40th anniversary. A restored version was undertaken by Robert A. Harris and Jim Payton under the supervision of director David Lean. It was released in 1989 with a 216 minute length. Most of the cut scenes were dialogue sequences, particularly those involving General Allenby and his staff. Two whole scenes were completely excised Brighton's briefing of Allenby in Jerusalem before the de Racine and the British staff meeting in the field tent, and the Allenby briefing scene has still not been entirely restored. Much of the missing dialogue involves Lawrence's writing of poetry and verse, alluded to by Allenby in particular, saying the last poetry General Alway had was Wellington. The opening of Act Two existed in only fragmented form, where Faisal is interviewed by Bentley, as well as the later scene in Jerusalem where Allenby convinces Lawrence not to resign. Both scenes were restored to the 1989 re-release. Some of the more graphic shots of the Tafas massacre scene were also restored such as the lengthy panning shot of the corpses in Tafas, and Lawrence shooting a surrendering Turkish soldier. Most of the still missing footage is of minimal import, supplementing existing scenes. One scene is an extended version of the de retorture sequence, which makes Lawrence's punishment more overt in that scene. Other scripted scenes exist, including a conversation between Auda and Lawrence immediately after the fall of Aqaba, a brief scene of Turkish officers noting the extent of Lawrence's campaign, and the Battle of Petra but these scenes were probably not filmed. The actors still living at the time of the re-release dubbed their own dialogue, though Jack Hawkins's dialogue had to be dubbed by Charles Gray, who had already provided Hawkins' voice for several films after Hawkins developed throat cancer in the late 1960s. A full list of cuts can be found at the Internet Movie Database. Reasons for the cuts of various scenes can be found in Lean's notes to Sam Spiegel, Robert Bolt, and Ann V. Coates. The film runs 227 minutes in the most recent director's cut available on Blu-ray disc and DVD. Lawrence of Arabia has been released in five different DVD editions, including an initial release as a two-disc set, followed by a shorter single-disc edition, a high-resolution version of the director's cut with restored scenes issued as part of the Super Bit series, as part of the Columbia Best Picture S collection, and in a fully restored special edition of the director's cut. Martin Scorsese and Steven Spielberg helped restore a version of the film for a DVD release in 2000.
Scotland, an 8K scan slash 4K intermediate digital restoration was made for Blu-ray and theatrical re-release during 2012 by Sony Pictures to celebrate the film's 50th anniversary. The Blu-ray edition of the film was released in the United Kingdom on September 10, 2012 and in the United States on November 13, 2012. The film received a one-day theatrical release on October 4, 2012 a two-day release in Canada on 11 and November 15, 2012, and was also re-released in the United Kingdom on November 23, 2012. According to Grover Crisp, executive VP of Restoration at Sony Pictures, the new 8K scan has such high resolution that when examined, showed a series of fine concentric lines in a pattern reminiscent of a fingerprint near the top of the frame. This was caused by the film emulsion melting and cracking in the dessert heat during production. Sony had to hire a third party to minimize or eliminate the rippling artifacts in the new restored version. The digital restoration was done by Sony Colorworks DI, Prasad Studios, and MTI Film. A 4K digitally restored version of the film was screened at the 2012 Cannes Film Festival, at the 2012 Carlo Viveri International Film Festival, at the Visionella Internacional de Cinema in Recife, Brazil, and at the 2013 Cinequest Film Festival in San Jose, California. Upon its release, Lawrence of Arabia was a huge critical and financial success and it remains popular among viewers and critics alike. The film's visuals, score, screenplay and performance by Peter O'Toole have all been common points of acclaim. The film as a whole is widely considered a masterpiece of world cinema and one of the greatest films ever made. Additionally, its visual style has influenced many directors, including George Lucas, Sam Peckinpah, Stanley Kubrick, Martin Scorsese. Ridley Scott, Brian De Palma, Oliver Stone, and Steven Spielberg, who called the film a miracle. The American Film Institute ranked Lawrence of Arabia fifth in its original and seventh in its updated 100 years, 100 movies lists and first in its list of the greatest American films of the epic genre. In 1991, the film was deemed culturally, historically, or aesthetically significant by the Library of Congress and selected for preservation in the United States National Film Registry. In 1999 the film placed third in the British Film Institute's poll of the best British films of the 20th century and in 2001 the magazine Total Film called it as shockingly beautiful and hugely intelligent as any film ever made and faultless. It was ranked in the top 10 films of all time in the 2002 Sight and Sound Directors poll. Additionally, O'Toole's performance is often considered one of the greatest in all of cinema, topping lists from both Entertainment Weekly and Premiere. T. E. Lawrence, portrayed by O'Toole was selected as the 10th Great Thero in cinema history by the American Film Institute. In addition, Lawrence of Arabia is currently one of the highest-rated films on Metacritic, it holds a perfect 100-100s rating, indicating universal acclaim, based on seven reviews. It has a 98% certified fresh approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes based on 80 reviews with an average rating of 9. One tenth from critics with the consensus stating, the epic of all epics. Lawrence of Arabia cements director David Lean's status in the filmmaking pantheon with nearly four hours of grand scope, brilliant performances, and beautiful cinematography. Some critics, notably Bosley Crowther and Andrew Saris, have criticized the film for an indefinite portrayal of Lawrence and lack of depth. Film director Steven Spielberg considers this his favorite film of all time and the one that inspired him to become a filmmaker. In 1991, this film was deemed culturally historically, or aesthetically significant and selected for preservation in the United States Library of Congress National Film Registry. In 2012, the Motion Picture Editors Guild listed the film as the seventh best edited film of all time based on a survey of its membership. In 1990, the made-for-television film A Dangerous Man, Lawrence After Arabia was aired. It depicts events in the lives of Lawrence and Faisal subsequent to Lawrence of Arabia and featured Rafe Fiennes as Lawrence and Alexander sit against Prince Faisal. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.